Hello, poisoners and pranksters. My name is TB's Guy, and welcome back to the boss designs of Dark Souls 2. So, last time we spent most of the video just wandering around and exploring things, including a little foray into one of the DLC areas which I managed to stumble my way into. But having come up across a particular roadblock, I made the decision that that was probably enough exploration for now, and decided to turn my attention to yet another poisonous area that I have been avoiding. The Harvest Valley. Hello, lady who's sitting there holding a skull. Are you a traveler? I'm Cloan. An ore stone trader. I travel about collecting rare stones. Hey, hang on. To make my living. Is that I the blacksmith's daughter? This God's forsaken place. But I don't know. I just sort of ended up here. I must have just wandered in. <laughs> but now that I'm here, I've been scouting around for rare bits. Oh, don't look at me like that. Many of these stones are quite useful. For instance, certain stones are used in smithing. Ah, oh, now your ears prick up. <laughs> I've extras if you can pay. This is my trade, after all. Tight nut shards, bonfire aesthetic. So she basically just has tight nut shards for the moment. Okay. So presumably if I buy a bunch from her, she maybe gets better stuff? Okay. So, crawling hollows that I remember do poison damage. And then a big ogre looking guy. Oh. Oh, he throws things! He throws magic! Just gonna get rid of you. Master blaster. So the gas down here presumably will poison the crap out of me. And all of these items lying around are traps, basically. A lot of people died from poison down here. I guess they'll usually come here earlier. Oh, there's a cave over there. That's just... I like the windmills here. Fragrant branch of yore, nice. Wheel, therefore, fr is there gonna be a skeleton wheel in here? Oh. Oh, hello! Gavlan! Gavlan Nui. Gavlan Wheel. Gavlan Deal. Gavlan wants soul. Many, many, many soul. soul. <laughs> <laughs> what does he have this time? Ring of Giants? I've already got one of those. Poison arrows, neat. A bunch of poison moss. Cost fifteen hundred a pop though. Like, well, I guess it's a seller's market. <laughs> Don't need him. So, is this where he is permanently, or is he gonna be gone again? Well, it doesn't matter. It's nothing there. He got doesn't have anything I need or want. These are enemies, I take it. Yup. What's your problem, lady? Jesus. So, are they slave masters, and is this like a? Forced labor camp? That looks breakable. It's not breakable. Oh, f you. Something exploded. What the hell exploded? Titanite shard, large titanite shard, and pale stone. No, I didn't want to climb down. I wanted to read the message. Try torch and then confidence. So that guy has enslaved the creature, and it's the creature that's casting spells. <laughs> nice tumble animation. Danger zone ahead. I don't doubt it. Oh! Oh no! Oh, come on! Uh, what was I supposed to do? So. In there, I'm fucked. Because I can't come back up, but I can still keep going this way.
Thanks for the help. Oh, I needed him to help me break the... What's even in there? Just items? I want my sh** back. So that's a different place than... Where you go if you fall down with the... If you go down the ladder. Alright, sure, f*** it, why not? This is a terrible idea. Yeah, it's not great. It's not a- it's not a fantastic idea. Oh! Well. Alright. Well, that's nice. Ah! It's poisoning all the jars! Of course there is. Jesus. Alright. Not gonna bother trying to look for items, then. Well, that's good. Now I have a bonfire, which means I can go and die to those bastards over there. Again. To reclaim my stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Okay, I cannot figure out their timings. Uh-oh. No! 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 Oh. Yeah, that was gonna happen. Okay, well... Oh, wait, uh, the, 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 the big guy should be back. So if I, if I go up to this guy, and... Neener, 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 you can hit me, 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 me. Come on. Thank you. Much obliged. Old Pike, an old knight great shield. That sounds like it's got a story behind it. Wielded by a warrior from a time so ancient that there exists no record of his endeavors, has extremely low durability. Oh, it's it's just the old stuff. Uh, okay. One last dance with these guys. Oh, son of a bitch. That's one. Okay. Yeah, because I can't stagger them. At all! Jesus. Jerks. Now, how do I get out of here? Through one of these, I bet. Hey, there it is. Just gonna go grab the last item. If I haven't already. Is that all of it? Am I done? Am I free? I am free! To move on, to get the hell out of here. Petrified something, huh? Bug? By the way, not here. Bug. That kind of looks like if I jump down there, I die. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. Well. There's nothing left except going through the pool now, I guess. Oh, that's a big hammer you got there, buddy. Hello! You are big, and you have a hammer. Oh, Jesus. Dealing with that guy and with fireballs coming down, great. Oh, I see. It's another ninja. I think? Oh, yeah. It's a headless ninja! Why did that man not have a head at all? Okay, so just a... A ton of poison jars in here, as this man has kindly demonstrated for us. Wow, you're dumb. <laughs> well, thanks for clearing a path. Okay, so we can go that way, and we can go this way, and that leads to the same room. It looks like, uh, yeah. Well, sorta.
<laughs> Hello. Earthen Peak. <laughs> I love this so much. Ah! Hoisted by my own petard! Do it. I think the hell not. Whoa! That was a reflection! Ah! Why do these men not have any heads at all? There you are. So that might be a boss door. Right around the corner. There's a headless man waiting to kill me. Why though with the no heads having fatty a head weakness jog? Oh, that sounds That sounds like ungenerous language. I have found mist, which means there's a boss chance. Oh, yes. Oh. Oh, that was ungenerous language. Hello. Covetous demon. Huh? Ugh, well, this is a little trite. Oh, you see, he's greedy, so he's fat! Ha 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 ha! Yeah, yeah. That's a bit tired. Oh, okay, he does that. That's a bit tired, isn't it? Fire doesn't do much to him. Why? Spit me out! Oh. Oh, I see. You took my f***ing equipment! Oh, okay, no, he didn't took take it, he just unequipped it. Okay. For a second, I just thought I'd lost everything. Well, that was a boss, I guess. I feel like I was a little overpowered for him. Yeah, so the covetous demon. He's covetous, so he... Yeah, he's lost so much fatty nonsense, God damn it. <sighs> Eating is an expression of desire. There once was a man whose deep affections were unrequited. He transformed into the covetous demon, which only made him lonelier than before. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you can't tell, I'm a little I'm a little tired of the whole ha 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 fat people are greedy thing, because it's such a cheap shot. So obviously both past Sky and I have some uh, negative feelings about this particular character design, but we'll put that aside for now and approach the character design like we have all of the others within the context of Dark Souls 2, and then we'll circle back around to have an extended discussion about my problems with the character design at the end. Fortunately, the covetous demon seems to me at least a relatively simple design to analyze. He is essentially a giant mouth with a little bit of body attached to facilitate putting things into the mouth. His design is worm-like, he reminds me more than anything of Jabba the Hutt, and because he is naked of fur, you look at his face and you are ultimately forced to see a somewhat human expression in them. The arrangement of the eyes, the nose, and the big ridges that form his eyebrows is not exactly human, but together with his nakedness, it's just human enough to force you to make that connection. His soul, and the weapon that can be forged from it, which I took some time to go and look at later, tells us everything we need to know about his own personal story. As the soul says, eating is an expression of desire. There once was a man whose deep affections were unrequited. He transformed into the covetous demon, which only made him lonelier than before. And the bone scythe's description continues, that thing that ended of a monstrous fiend, what was it to begin with and why did it never leave the queen? Perhaps it was entranced by some perversion of love. So the covetous demon is a man who is in love with the queen of this particular castle, but because the queen does not love him back, because his desire is not fulfilled, 
it takes him over, it consumes him. Which ties in very nicely to the angle about personal identity that I've been pursuing this entire time. We see one more way in which a person can experience a total breakdown of identity, a total loss of self. And in this case, it's the subsumation of the self into an obsession with an other. And you can observe this kind of thing happening in toxic relationships in real life. In abusive relationships, for example, the victim will often go to great lengths to change themselves for the person that they are in love with. They'll change their look, they'll change their habits, they'll cut themselves off from friends. They will essentially obliterate the totality of the person that they used to be in order to be the person that they think their abuser will love. That being said though, I don't think the covetous demon is a victim of abuse here. He's more like a bitter narcissistic incel blaming everyone else for his inability to get the girl. And so he has planted himself at the bottom of her tower, devouring anyone else who might dare venture too close. Much like an incel, he is turned into a monster by a relentless and soul-destroying obsession with something that he cannot have and doesn't understand that he doesn't have a right to. So, after all this... What's my problem with the covetous demon's design? Well, it's that its design represents a series of tropes and value judgments that I don't like, which I think are actually kind of toxic. And I want to be clear about this. Like every other analysis in this series, what I'm about to offer you is an interpretation and an opinion. It's an opinion that I'm going to back up and argue for, but if you think I'm completely wrong and the design is fine and that my criticism is invalid, then God's peace be upon it, you're entitled to your own opinion. On the divine note, though, have you ever heard the phrase, your body is a temple? It comes up a lot in conversations about health and diet, especially, but here's a question. Your body is a temple to whom, exactly? The phrase comes from the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6.19, as part of a long moralizing rant by St. Paul. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Paul here was ranting against sexual indulgences and sins, and explicitly drew a connection that physical corruption leads to spiritual corruption as well, and vice versa. In Galatians 5.16, Paul further rants that what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. Now, fair warning, we're about to get kind of dry and academical, but we kind of have to in order to explain my criticism. In her book, Shameful Bodies, Religion and the Culture of Physical Improvement, professor of religion at Concordia College, Dr. Michelle Mary Lulwicka, writes that a vision of resurrected bodies as flawless is central to classic Christian eschatology. Eschatology is the part of theology that deals with the final judgment and the afterlife. In the eschatological, virtuous believers will enjoy the rewards of eternal life in flesh that is fit for paradise. Freed from the stains of sin, corruption, and death that hamper life on earth, resurrected bodies represent an angelic or perfected state, relieved of and redeemed from the burdens, needs, changes, and limits of embodied life. By equating bodily redemption with physical perfection, early church leaders systematically removed somatic impairments, afflictions, and irregularities from God's kingdom, and in so doing, they implicitly conflated disease, deformity, and disability with sin, impurity, and punishment. The covetous demon lusts, and that lust turns to greed and gluttony, and those sins turn him into a demon, monstrous in his all-consuming fatness. Especially in the Western world, these tropes feel pretty natural, well-worn, familiar. They are a tale as old as time, an obvious idea. How do you show that someone has been corrupted by their sinful ways? Well, make them ugly, make them fat, make their bodies show the moral corruption of their spirit. But these tropes aren't natural. They are explicitly Christian moral ideas about virtue and body politics, and most of the time, we don't really examine them as such. Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Sabrina Strings, points out in her book, Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, that these Christian cultural values about the body are a consistent presence throughout European history. For example, in the tragedy of Julius Caesar, when Caesar states, Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men such as sleeper knights. 
Yond Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. The view of fat men as too self-indulgent to be particularly intelligent was embodied in the character of Sir John Falstaff. That's another Shakespeare character. Falstaff was creative and resourceful in some respects, but too much of a gluttonous, drunken braggart and thief to be taken as a thoughtful nobleman. He cops to this in Henry IV when he cries, If I do grow great, I'll grow less, for I'll purge and leave sack, that's drink, and live cleanly as a nobleman should do. According to Strings, these kinds of cultural expressions show a dread of fatness as indicative of a weak character and dullness of mind, which also found expression in the philosophies of people like René Descartes, who explicitly denounced base desires for food and drink as standing in the way of higher intellectual pursuits. This, in turn, ties into a long ascetic tradition associated with spiritual pursuits and devotion to God and questions of morality. In the present day, the most visible expression of this old Christian idea that the state of your body reflects the state of your virtue can be found in the diet and weight loss industry. Now, I trust that I don't have to go through the tremendously obvious things, like how celebrities who are already in impossibly good shape starve themselves and get photoshopped to be even thinner for magazine covers and get celebrated for it, or the endless barrage of weight loss regimens and fad diets with a flood of people surging into gyms every January because literally everybody feels like lose weight is a resolution they should have. As Professor Lelwicka writes, in mainstream medical self-help and commercial perspectives, weight loss epitomizes physical improvement. Through various social institutions and media, the belief that heavy is bad and thin is good has become part of our cultural catechism. Questioning such dogma is not just heresy, it's tantamount to lunacy or even treason. Indeed, the necessity of downsizing big bodies may be the one thing upon which people from every walk of life and political and religious persuasion largely agree. Contesting shame by embracing and converting it into self-acceptance and social critique is not a common dynamic in the culture of physical improvement. While there is no shortage of commercially sponsored calls to love your body, this message is consistently contradicted and overshadowed by body-perfecting prescriptions, products, and programs that implicitly suggest that the unimproved body is unworthy of such self-love. Indeed, the value system of consumer capitalism cannot afford for consumers to unconditionally love their bodies. Multiple industries depend on us feeling bad about some part of our anatomy, which is why marketers spend billions trying to trigger the very shame they promise to cure. Lelwicka further points out the ways in which these attitudes specifically target certain groups of people. In the early 20th century, large, fleshy figures were also associated with poor, working class or ethnic immigrants, especially Jews and Catholics from Eastern and Southern European countries or Ireland. Scientific and cultural authorities in this era differentiated between non-Jews and Jews by the fact that the latter were fat. The flip side of the association between the good body and the well-ordered self is seen in stereotypes surrounding those whose bodies don't conform to the normative ideal. People who are fat, old, disabled, chronically sick, or in pain are frequently perceived to be feeble-minded, needy, undisciplined. Heavyset people are assumed to be lazy. The elderly are seen as dependent. People with physical disabilities are frequently treated like children, and those living with chronic illnesses are often blamed for causing their own conditions by unhealthy choices. It's no coincidence that these undesirable, unvirtuous qualities, laziness, dependency, maturity, and irresponsibility, are also stereotypically applied to people who are poor. <sighs> okay, so that was a lot that I just threw at you here. So let's recap and then circle back to what this has to do with the covetous demon. So. The narrative and design concept that spiritual corruption is reflected in physical corruption and that physical corruption takes the shape of disability, fatness, and illness is an explicitly religious ideal expressed for centuries in Christian doctrine and dogma. Now, I should note that it's not exclusive to Christianity, but in Western Europe, which is where I live and the place that Dark Souls takes a lot of its inspiration from, it is very much a Christian idea. 
In more modern times, this idea that evil people are physically corrupted has been used to reinforce class divisions by stereotyping the poor as lazy and stupid, and to reinforce racist and eugenicist social rhetoric by portraying and stereotyping non-white, non-Christian people and women as physically inferior. In the present day, these same Christian body ideals are part of the animating force of the diet and weight loss industries who are busy flooding the modern world with deeply unhealthy and deceptive body ideals that are quite literally killing people. I dislike the covetous demon as a character design because he is an uncritical deployment of these tropes, these old Christian ideals filtered through centuries of secularization and capitalism. I dislike it because I find it on the one hand uncreative and on the other hand because I find the ideas and concepts that underlie his design to be harmful and bad when they are not critically examined. I dislike him because as we saw in the messages posted on the ground around him, he is one more big, fat, ugly bastard in media who makes it okay to look at fatness as a moral failure to be mocked and disdained. Now, I'm sure some of you have already noticed that the criticism I'm framing here, that showing moral decay with physical decay is a problematic trope, can apply to a lot more than just the covetous demon. And you're absolutely right about that. It is a functionally omnipresent trope in character design. It is impossible to get away from. And in some ways, it's baked into the foundations of character design as a discipline. So why bring it up with the covetous demon specifically and not anywhere else? Well, first of all, because the covetous demon is a really obvious expression of these tropes that makes it easier to talk about them, but also because some cases of this trope are a lot more harmful than others. Like I said, the stigmatization of fatness specifically quite literally kills people in the modern world. It leads to medical malpractice and housing and job discrimination and social ostracism and, you know, rampant capitalist exploitation of body image insecurity, among many other real and measurable issues. Uh, anyway, to try and preempt some of the exhausting comments that I'm sure some people have already written, no, none of this is a call to cancel FromSoft or calling for a Dark Souls boycott or somehow a call for censorship of free expression or whatever other 4chan boogeyman buzzword pops into certain people's heads when they hear the mildest social criticisms of a video game they like. This isn't a claim that FromSoft is evil or malicious, it's a critique of a design trope, an explanation why I don't like it. If you think differently, then that's your right as a person. Just know that I disagree with you, and I don't want to debate you about it. Finally, a shout out to my friend Keevan Bay, who very kindly provided me with advice and research materials and perspective for this episode. I've linked to some of his Twitter threads down below, where he discusses fat studies and body politics with substantially more rigor and expertise than I can. If the subject interests you at all, I recommend giving him a follow. I've also put links in the description to the sources I've cited in this video, in case you want to follow up and do any further reading on your own. Anyway, this episode was short on gameplay and long on dry analysis, so if you have watched it this far, I thank you very much. I do appreciate it. If you enjoy the boss designs of Dark Souls 2, please do consider sharing this video with other people who you think might enjoy it. The YouTube algorithm doesn't really push these videos very much, and this is a six-year-old video game that's generally considered the worst of the trilogy, so every bit helps. If you want to support me more directly, then Patreon is there for that if you want to sign up for a monthly donation. If you just want to give me like a one-time tip, then there's a tip jar down in the description, and I do have a merchandise store if you feel in the mood to buy something. If you don't want to support me directly though, that's completely okay. Believe me, I, I get it. At the end of my videos though, I do try to encourage people to support the content creators that they love directly with whatever they can, whenever they can. Even a $1 donation, even though it doesn't feel like much, can be the same as thousands of views on a video or hundreds of ad views on Twitch. So whether it's me or someone else, please consider supporting the content that you love directly because it matters so much more than you think. If you haven't enjoyed this video, well, there's a dislike button down below, but before you hit it, I will have to quiz you on last week's reading assignment. Y you did do the reading assignment, right? Oh, you've gotta be kidding me. It counts for like a third of your grade. With your GPA, you can't afford to fail another class. The Dean will revoke your scholarship. You'll never play varsity football again. Thank you very much for watching. 